God wants us to be deeply rooted and securely grounded in his immeasurable love for us. Out of his immeasurable love, God extends rich mercy and abundant grace. Understanding and personally experiencing his immeasurable love makes us whole and restores our capacity to be loved and to love. Last Sunday we started talking about the father's love and uh, we 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 are uh, spreading this entire series over six Sundays so today is part 2 uh, in this series on the father's love i just want to quickly uh, recap some of the things we mentioned last sunday and then take it forward a little further this morning we began by saying that our revelation of god affects our relationship with god how you look at god will affect how you relate to god and that's why this whole teaching this whole understanding on the father's love is so important for you and me to know that we are so loved by god so that we can relate to him based on his love for us and our relationship with god then affects our relationship with ourselves and our relationship with others as well we said that last sunday and in the context of that we uh we we said that you know uh we need to understand that god is our father in heaven and his love for us is unlimited he wants to relate to us he wants us to understand him as a father who loves us god is relational uh he he loves and he can be loved and he has created us in his image we can love and we can also be loved but the problem is that we are broken our capacity to love and our capacity to be loved is broken and in that context we saw some of the wrong postures that we might have in our relationship with god and sometimes we look at god we constantly look at god as the prodigal son now we've all been prodigals at some time but that's not how he wants us to live the rest of our lives he wants us to move from being the prodigals to being sons and daughters those who enjoy uh, having him as our heavenly father uh, uh, as the father who loves us so we talked about several different postures that we need to correct in our lives so this morning we're going to build that up further and we want to emphasize or focus on the on god's immeasurable love for us god's immeasurable love for us we want to focus on that this morning so let's start with ephesians chapter 3 verses 17 to 19 ephesians 3 17 to 19 i also want to thank uh praveen and alban who did the paintings here worship paintings during worship time praveen thank you alban thank you god bless you uh after service you could come and have a closer look at it i know uh, those of you may be seated far away may not be uh, able to see that but please come and have a look uh, at this expression of of worship towards god through art and uh, thank god for all the various abilities and graces he's given us we need to use them all to glorify god amen so ephesians chapter 3 verses 17 and 18 i'm reading from the amplified bible Uh, it just uh, uh, it helps us see a little bit more uh, here's what the apostle paul writes he says to the believers i'm praying this for you what is he praying for god's people he says i'm praying that christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and may you having been deeply rooted and securely grounded in love be fully capable of comprehending with all the saints that is God's people the width and length and de- and height and depth of his love fully experiencing that amazing endless love and that you may come to know practically through personal experience the love of Christ which far surpasses mere knowledge without experience that you may be filled up throughout your being to all the fullness of God so that you may have the richest experience of God's presence in your lives completely filled and flooded with God himself i want to highlight some things here from these verses in verse 17 the apostle paul 
tells us, he wants us to be deeply rooted and securely grounded in love. He's talking about the love of God. So here's something very important for all of us. We need to be deeply rooted like a tree whose roots have gone deep into the soil. So that no matter what storms blow and whatever happens, that tree is standing. We need to be deeply rooted. And he says, I want you to be securely grounded. It's like a building whose foundation is secure and cannot be shaken. So I want you to be deeply rooted and securely founded in God's love. Amen? Are you with me? So as believers, this is very important, that you and I are deeply rooted and securely grounded in the love of God, in the Father's love for us. So that no matter what happens, no matter what people say, no matter what life throws at you, no matter what turbulence you go through, you will be settled knowing that God Almighty loves you. Amen? Now that's very important, to know that God loves you. But for some of us, we're not very sure. I mean, God loves my neighbor, but for me, I'm not very really sure. I'm not sure if he really loves me. Or we measure God's love by what happens. You know, if your boss smiles at you and gives you a raise, hmm, God loves you. <laughs> but at the end of the day, he's angry with you, upset with you. Hmm, maybe God doesn't love me. And so our barometer for the love of God is our boss. No. Be deeply rooted, firmly grounded in God's love for you. So that no matter what happens, you know inside you, God the Father loves you. Nothing can change that. Amen? So Paul is praying. He's saying, believers, I'm praying this for you. That you will be deeply rooted, firmly, securely grounded in the love of God. And I hope that through these six Sundays when we cover this whole message on the Father's love, at the end of it, this will be real in each one of us. That each one of us will be deeply rooted and securely grounded in the Father's love. Nothing can shake us. It's very important. And then he says in the next verse, verse 18, I want you to know, I want you to comprehend with all the saints. That word comprehend is uh, not just an intellectual understanding, as he explains further on in the Greek, that word comprehend simply means to possess, to seize, to have as your own. He says, I want you to personally have as your own. Have it in your pocket, not in your neighbor's pocket. Are you in your father's or mother's pocket? No. Have it in you to seize, to apprehend, to have, possess in your own this, this love of God whose width, length, depth, and height is actually immeasurable. But I want you to have that in your possession. Amen? So to be so deeply rooted and securely grounded is for you through your personal experience. You have it in your possession that God's love for you is so great. There is no measure of the length, the breadth, the depth, and the height of that love. And that love is on you. You are surrounded by that love. And so I want you to have that in your possession. Amen? Amen? I mean, nothing can shake you and nothing can rob you of your personal experience of the love of God. When you have personally experienced God's immeasurable love for you, no one can take it from you. No one can tell you otherwise. No circumstance can deny you or tell you that your heavenly father does not love you. Because you already have comprehended it 
Sounds like Spanish, but you have possessed it. <laughs> you have apprehended it. It's in your possession. This immeasurable love that the Father has for you. So he says in verse 19, I want you to know. That means practically through personal experience, the love of Christ. So here's another aspect of God's love. God's love is immeasurable. He uses language that you and I are familiar with. He talks about the width of God's love. And God's love is as wide as the world. For God so loved the whole world that he gave his only son. If you want to put an expression to the length of his love, it's as far as the farthest one of us has wandered. Because the Bible says all of us like sheep have gone astray. But no one has gone so far that he wouldn't pay for us. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So how, how, what's the length of God's love? It's as far as the farthest one has gone. If you want to put an expression to the depth of his love, it's as deep as the uttermost. Or it's as deep as the lowest hell that we've put ourselves into because the Bible says he's able to save us to the uttermost. If you want to say how high is the love of God, it's as high as the heavens above. Because, the Bible says, because he loved us so much, he took us up all the way and seated us with him in heavenly places. There's no measure to this love. And this love is enduring, it's timeless, it's untiring love. Time comes and goes but his, the strength of his love does not dissipate in any way. He says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. So none of us are outside the realm of God's immeasurable love. And really, the Bible points us to the cross. The center, centrality of the expression of God's love is the cross of Jesus Christ. There is no greater expression of God's love for us than the cross of Jesus Christ itself. So if you and I want to get some understanding of how much God loves you and me, God, the, the word of God points us to the cross. And you and I are familiar with John 3.16. I'll mention some verses here. For God so loved the world. What did he do? He gave his only son. So he says, I love you so much. And here's my expression of love. I'm giving you my son. So anytime you want to be reminded of the love of God, look at the cross. Thank him for Jesus. For what he did on the cross. So don't look at how good, how well things are going in life. Those things will keep changing. Don't look at how well your boss is treating you. That keeps changing. Don't look at how much money you have. That keeps changing. See, don't look at those things. If you want an, a solid, unchangeable expression of God's love for you, there's only one thing the Bible points you and me to. It says, look at the cross. The cross of Jesus. For God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him will not die, but have everlasting life. And just a couple of more verses here. Verse 8 of Romans 5 says, But God demonstrates, God expresses, God displays his love for us. How did he display his love for us? In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the expression 
of God's love. Or John captures it like this in 1 John 4, 9 and 10. He says, in this, is, in this the love of God was manifested towards us. Or in this God expresses his immeasurable love for us. He says there, that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, verse 10 of 1 John 4, but that he loved us and, his, and sent his son to be the payment or the propitiation for our sins. So God is saying, if you want an idea of how much I love you, if you want an expression, a tangible expression of my immeasurable love, here's one thing I want you to look at. Look at the cross. Look at what I've done for you in sending my son Jesus to die for you. That while you were still a sinner, while you had gone as far as you could go, or as low as you could go, or wherever you went, as no matter who you were, what, what you've done, I sent my son to die for you on the cross in order to bring you to be with me. That's how much I love you. And you and I need to be deeply rooted and securely grounded in the love of God for us as expressed through the death and resurrection of His Son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. Amen? Base your love on God's expression of it through the cross of Jesus Christ. Look to the cross. Any time you have doubts if God loves you, remember the cross of Jesus Christ. Because God says, that's my display of my immeasurable love for you. And so God's love, as we've said earlier, it is so wide that it includes every person. It is so long, it reaches to the farthest sinner. It's so deep, it reaches down to the uttermost place. It's so high, it lifts us up to God himself. That's God's love for you and me. He wants you to be with him. He wants you as part of his family. He wants you right by his side. He wants you to fellowship with him. He wants you to experience his love. And the cross of Jesus, if you and I come to an understanding of what God did for us through the cross, not only are our sins forgiven, not only are we brought into fellowship with God, not only are we made sons and daughters of God, but God restores us. He makes us whole. There is healing through the cross. And it includes the healing of our capacity to love and be loved. When you realize how much God loved you through the cross, then... You and I. And when we receive that love, that love makes us whole. We receive love and therefore we are able to love others. When you look at other people, you look at them as, for God so loved John, for God so loved Mary, for God so loved so and so, that he gave his only begotten son. So your capacity to love them is also restored. When you receive that love from God. Amen. So wholeness comes through this. Uh, through receiving uh, the cross. The message of the cross. Now what I want us to understand is this. Because of his great love. There is abundant mercy and grace. Out of God's love. He releases mercy and grace to us. I want to read a passage of scripture. And then let's explain this. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 through 7. Paul just narrates the, the whole work God has done in our lives spiritually. We'll read to the whole passage. Verse 1, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. So we were dead in sins. In which you once walked according to the course of this world. So we just lived according to the ways of the world. According to the prince of the power of the air. That means we're actually under the influence of darkness. The spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Verse 3, Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. That means we lived according to our own sinful desires. We did all the wrong things. Now look at verse 4. But God, who was rich in mercy, because of his great love, 
with which he loved us. God is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. That means he said, I love you so much, I'm going to be rich in mercy. So I'm going to give you mercy beyond what you need. I'm going to extend mercy to you. But God, who was rich in mercy, because of his great love. Because God loves you, he is merciful to you. Because God loves us, he loves me, he is merciful to me. And not only is he rich in mercy, but he continues there in verse 5. Even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ by grace. You have been saved. So now, not only is there mercy, God does something for us by grace. Verse 6, he raised us up together. He made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ. Meaning, out of his grace, he did all this. He loved us so much, he extended mercy. And then he went a step further, he gave us grace. In his grace, he said, I'll take you, pick you, make you sit right next to me. That's grace. So mercy and grace is extended to us because of God's immeasurable love. So that in the ages to come, verse 7, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. He's rich in mercy. He's rich in grace. So let's say this together just to make sure we're all awake. He's rich in mercy. And he's rich in grace. Let's say one more time. He's rich in mercy. He's rich in grace. Now, what does that mean? You know, uh, look, if, if there was a rich man, if your need was 100 rupees, and there was a rich man, he can meet your need. But if you went to a poor man, he may empathize with your need. But he's sorry, I have nothing to give you. He can't meet your need. But God is rich in mercy. And he's rich in grace. No matter how much mercy you need, no matter how much grace you need, God's got more than enough for you. He's rich in mercy, rich in grace. Out of his immeasurable love, he's extending mercy to you. He's extending grace to you. Now, the parable or the story of the prodigal son reveals or explains to us or captures for us mercy and grace. Because sometimes we don't understand, what is mercy, what is grace? So, you look at the parable story of the prodigal son. I'll read it because many of us know this story, but we've heard it in Sunday school. It's quite a long time ago. So, it's good to read it again. So, please listen to Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 32. I'll just read it for us, just to refresh our memory. So, Jesus said this story. He said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to him his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possession with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, uh, bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, 
his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. If this story is illustrating to us God's love for us, this is one place in the Bible you see God running. And he is running to the sinner that's coming back to him. And so the father runs and kisses him. And look at what happens. Verse 21. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his hands and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his older son was in the field. And he came and drew near to the house. He heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come. Because he has received him safe and sound. Your father has killed the fatted calf. But he, the elder brother, was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your command, commandment at any time. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came who devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me and all that I have is yours. And it was your right that we should make, and it was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and found, and is found. Look at mercy, look at grace. The father embraces this prodigal son. Not one rebuke, not one question, not one word about what he had done. Mercy forgives. In his mercy, the father forgave all the wrong the son had done. The wasting away the fortune, the dishonor, the disrepute he brought to the family, the degrading of his own life to the point of being taking care of the pigs and eating the food of the pigs. Not one word. He forgave all of that. That is mercy. God is rich in mercy. He is rich. He is rich in mercy. Out of his great love, he has given mercy. He's rich in mercy to us. Not only did the father welcome the son, but what did he do? The son said, just make me like one of your servants. The father said, Bring the best robe, bring the ring, put sandals, let's have briyani. I mean, let's celebrate. That is grace. Grace gives us what we do not deserve. God is merciful. He forgives all the wrong. But he's not only rich in mercy, he's also rich in grace. He gives us what we don't deserve. He says, I take you from where you were and I make you sit at my own right hand. And I make you my heir and a joint heir with my son, Jesus Christ. Do we deserve it? No. But God is rich in grace. Amen. So this morning, I simply want us to understand. Or at least try to begin to receive God's immeasurable love. Come to a place where you and I are so deeply rooted and securely grounded in the Father's immeasurable love for us. And out of that love, there is an unending flow of mercy and grace. This is not to say that we misuse God's love or misuse the mercy and grace He extends to us. 
But this is to give us hope, and this is to encourage us, and this is to empower us, and this is to take us to a new level of living where we are unshakable. No matter what happens, we know our Heavenly Father loves us, and there is always mercy, there is always grace to us. Amen? Mercy forgives, and grace gives what we don't deserve. Mercy forgives the wrong we've done, and in, and in grace, He extends to us what we do not deserve. So the love of the Father is beyond measure, revealed to us in His Son, Jesus Christ. And this morning, I want you to understand, I want us to understand the Father loves us with an immeasurable, untiring love for us. Amen? But we must receive. We must comprehend. That means we must possess personally. It's not like, well, he, ha he got it. He got it. No. You possess it. You receive it by faith from your side. Say, Father, I thank you. You love me like this. I'm accepting this truth that you love me with an immeasurable love. And you've extended mercy and grace to me. Amen. Next Sunday, we'll build on this a little further to see how this then transforms our lives on a day-to-day -day, day -day basis. As we progress, we will learn more on how this love transforms us. But I want us to take a few moments, please, to pray this morning. Right where you are seated, would you pray and say, God, I thank you you love me like this. Make it personal. You talk to him. You comprehend. You know or receive personally. Possess it for yourself. Thank you that you love me. If there's anyone here this morning... And you have never personally made a decision in your life to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And what He did for you on the cross. That He died for your sins. That He was buried, He rose again. And therefore, you personally could be forgiven of your sins. And brought it to a relationship with Almighty God. If you've never personally believed in Jesus... As the one who paid for your sins on the cross. If you, you've never made that decision. You've never made that choice to believe in Jesus Christ. As the one who saves you from sin and makes you a child of God. Then this morning, we want to give you an invitation. An opportunity to do that. Right where you are. In this auditorium or any of the overflow spaces. If you've never done this before in, you, in your life, I want to lead you in a simple prayer so that you can believe in Jesus and receive that love and receive forgiveness and become a child of God and start this journey of personally possessing that love that God has for you. Would you pray this with me, please, if you've never done this before? Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I have done wrong things. But thank you for sending Jesus to die for my sins on the cross. I believe he died for me. I believe he rose again. And he's alive today. Forgive my sins. And Lord Jesus, be the Lord and Savior of my life. And help me follow you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Has anyone you prayed this prayer with me for the very first time? Either you're up in the auditorium, in the auditorium here, on the overflow, anywhere. Just raise your hand if you prayed this prayer with me for the very first time. We just want to celebrate with you. Anyone here, you prayed this prayer with me for the very first time. Just raise your hand. I may not be able to see all the hands. I don't know how many are there. I see one hand right up here. God bless you. Anybody else? Another hand there. Anybody else? God bless you. Just look around, please. And make sure that they get this green bag. If you pray this prayer with me this morning, just hold your hand up high. Our, our, our greeters will want to come and give you this green bag and a card. where You can write your name and number and hand it back to them, please. So if you're in the basement, if you're in the overflow, the same thing. Just raise your hand and our greeters will come and give you this green bag. And you write your name and your contact details and hand it back to them. They will be, we will be in touch with you so we can help you in this journey. In the bag are some resources to help you grow in your journey with God. God is rich in mercy. He is rich in grace. In His mercy, He forgives the wrong we've done. In His grace, He gives us what we do not even deserve. All that He has, He wants to give to us because of His grace. I want to take a time, this moment right now, to pray for our personal needs. We won't have time to just pray for every person individually, but I'm just going to pray from here right now. Why don't we all just stand to our feet, please? And we're going to pray. So if you need healing in your body, you need a miracle in your circumstance, in your situation, uh, if there's a wrong that maybe you've done wrong and, and, and you need that situation to be turned around, God is full of mercy and grace. And we are going to pray. As I pray from here, I want you to believe God in His love. He extends mercy and grace to us. He heals. He turns situations around. He works miracles in our lives. He is our provider. He is our rescuer. He is our bondage breaker as we heard. And so as I pray right now, I want you to stoop. Look to God and say, God, because you love me, because Jesus Christ died for me, I receive your touch in my life. Whether it's healing, whether it's a breaking of some addiction and bondage, some torment in your mind, whether it's a situation that you need turned around, whether you need God to intervene in your finances, your some other problem in your life you want God to intervene. I want you to believe God with me right now. I will pray from here. But right where you are, you receive from God. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus for every need in this place, oh God. In Jesus' name, I take authority over every sickness, every disease in body or mind. And I say you're the work of the devil. In Jesus' name, be removed, be destroyed. Every sickness, every disease, every torment, every evil work of the enemy, I take it out in the name of Jesus. And I say God's people are healed by the stripes of Jesus. Every sick person be healed in the name of Jesus. That every affliction, every torment leave every disorder in the body every malfunction in the body be made normal be made whole in the name of jesus lord i also pray father that you would release miracles in the lives of people situations that they need they need, they need turned around release miracles into their situations financial problems other kinds of situations where they needed the one intervention. Father, release miracles. Release your deliverance. In the name of Jesus. I send deliverance. I send divine intervention. Angelic intervention into your situations. Into your circumstances. In the name of Jesus. There will be a turnaround. A miracle, miracle of God. A divine intervention in your situation, your circumstance. Father, thank you for doing this for your people today. We honor you and we bless you. In Jesus' name. 
Amen. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also visit our website apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.